We're going to be talking about tropical cyclones, and I'll begin by making the clarification that whether I use the word tropical cyclones, if I shorten it as TCs, or if I say hurricanes or tropical storms, I'm referring to the same. So broadly speaking, tropical cyclones are just this family of tropical systems. When they are weak, we call them tropical storms. When they get stronger, we call them hurricanes in this part of the world but in other parts of the world, they call them typhoons. But they're all the same. So I always like to begin this by asking you to take a moment to think what comes to your mind when you hear either of these world, words. And I bet you are all thinking about something that looks like this. And fortunately, the last hurricane season gave us a lot of examples that look like this. So this is a satellite image, so we're looking from from space down to earth, uh, and this is an image of Hurricane Isabel. And I like to use this image because it's essentially like a textbook example of what a hurricane is lo looks like. So broadly speaking, a hurricane is just a system of rotating clouds around a center of low pressure. That center of low pressure is usually cloud-free, that's what we know as the eye, but immediately surrounding the eye we have the heaviest rain and the strongest winds in what we know as the eye wall. And even though we have the strongest wind there, the rain can extend hundreds of kilometers away in these regions that we know as the rain bands, which is just what the name suggests, just bands of heavy precipitation. Broadly speaking, tropical cyclones go through this life cycle where you have a center of low pressure with clouds that are not necessarily organized. They may organize and become a tropical cyclone. That's what we know as tropical cyclogenesis. If the conditions are right, and we're going to talk about what the conditions are, then the tropical cyclone may intensify. That is, when I say the word intensify, that means that the winds are becoming are blowing harder, so the winds are strengthening, this center pressure may be lowering. And then, broadly speaking, after the hurricane has reached its maximum intensity, it may run into cool waters, so hurricanes happen over warm waters, so it may, they may run into cool waters, they may run into land, decay, and then disappear. So broadly speaking, this is the life cycle of what tropical cyclones are like. So one of the mysteries is in this science of tropical cyclones is how a group of clouds can form into these coherent systems and also how even after we have a tropical cyclone how it can become so powerful and so destructive like this. So the problem I focus on is this problem um, that this problem of we already have a tropical cyclone can we know if it's going to become very strong or not? So when it comes to tropical cyclones, they can cause a lot of destruction because of the wind, because of the rain. In fact, rain is the leading cause of fatalities associated with tropical cyclones. Uh, actually, water, which includes both the flooding from the rain and also the storm surge, or the water that gets pushed inland. So clearly, these systems are very impactful, and we want to predict them, and we want to predict them well. So how well do we do? Let's take a look at numbers. Some of you already saw this. So here we're looking at the forecast error in the y-axis, and forecast error means like how well did we do, like or did the forecasters do? So the observed position minus what was forecasted, and it is average as a function of year. We have different colors because this, in this case, we're looking at the track, so where a tropical cyclone is going to go. So that is forecasted one, two, and up to five days in advance. And what we see in here is that irregardless if we're looking at 24-hour forecasts or five-day forecasts, in all of them we see a decreasing trend, meaning that we're doing good because we're getting better and we're improving the prediction of where a tropical cyclone is going to be. In fact, it is getting so good that at a conference that I was last week, somebody was arguing that we may not be even be able to get better than this because of the inherent limitations of the atmosphere being a complicated system and because of the limitations, we may not get better, but we're 
generally, we know with some degree of certainty where a tropical cyclone is going to go. Now, in terms of how strong it's going to be, the story is a little bit different. This is the same chart, but it's for intensity forecast. And now what we see is a little bit of a mess. So if we look at 24 hours forecast, they have barely improved anything in the past almost 25, almost 30 years. Uh, this go up to 2016, by the way. The long-term forecast, so five days, four days in advance, they have been improving some, but it's not clear that we're improving as much as in terms of where, where the tropical cyclone is going to go. So it is this problem that I'm interested on. And of course, it is a problem that intrigues many other people. So there has been research about it. And when it comes to the intensity of the tropical cyclone, we can think of what's happening around the tropical cyclone. So in the science of tropical cyclones, we have our tropical cyclone that, like that satellite image that I showed you in the beginning. And then we have the environment, which is essentially everything that's happening around the tropical cyclone and also underneath and above. So for example, the environment, you may hear that, oh, the sea surface temperatures are very high. In fact, this year, the sea surface temperatures are very warm. And you may hear, okay, that, that is a good like, indicator of strong tropical cyclones. But then there are other things in the environment, like the humidity and also what I focus on, which is the environmental vertical wind shear. And wind shear is just a measurement of how the winds are varying with height. And we tend to calculate that by taking the vector difference between the winds at 200 millibars, so approximately like 15 kilometers, and near the surface, 800 millibars. So that vector difference tells us and some information of how the winds are varying with height. And it turns out that this is important because like, the stronger the shear, so the more the, the variations of the winds with height, the less likely a tropical cyclone is to intensify. So again, you may hear, okay, sea surface temperatures are good, but maybe it may not intensify because the shear is strong. But as it turns out, we've learned during hurricanes, recent hurricane seasons that some tropical cyclones can intensify even when there is shear. And here's one example, it's Hurricane Joaquin. On the left, a satellite image taken on September 29 when it was a tropical storm. And it doesn't look like that image I showed you at the beginning, right? But then two days later, it was able to intensify and it became like a powerful category for hurricane, like winds of 100. They exceeded even 121 miles per hour after this. The, the snapshot that this was taken. So the reason I, I use this example is because I want to illustrate to you how difficult these cases are to forecast. And unfortunately, this particular forecast that was poor was combined with poor decisions and many other factors that unfortunately led to, the, to a big tragedy in the Atlantic. In particular, there was a cargo ship that, because the forecasts were saying that that storm wasn't going to intensify, they still decided to go from, I believe it was Jacksonville to Puerto Rico. But in the middle of it, what they found was this very strong hurricane. So unfortunately, this tragedy happened, and the National Transportation and Safety Board decided to go into a mission to try to understand what was what happened. And when they interviewed the hurricane forecasters, one of them stated that one of the biggest challenges is trying to sort out about what's going to happen at intermediate levels of shear. So remember, shear, the variation of winds with height. So if it's too strong, we know the system will not intensify. If it's too weak, we know it may intensify. But when it's neither too strong nor too weak, that's what the biggest challenges is are for forecasting. And they proceeded to say, yeah, th this particular cyclone was difficult to forecast because, again, shear was not too strong nor too weak, so we didn't know which way it was going to go. 
And this proceeded to recommend the National Transportation and Safety Board to recommend to NOAA, which is the agency that issues official forecasts, to implement a plan to improve forecasts specifically for tropical cyclones in moderate shear. So hopefully I have convinced you that this is an important problem and this is what has motivated largely my research in which I am aiming at trying to understand how do weak tropical cyclones intensify under moderate shear. My hypothesis underlying here is that we can assume that shear is bad, sure, but maybe there are other factors that can offset the negative effects of shear and can help the tropical cyclone intensify. So shear is bad, but everything else may matter. So I'm going to proceed to tell you how I have tackled this problem. It is generally how I like to think about science problems, but perhaps most relevant to you, it's the outline for the rest of the talk. So I'm going to proceed to do a little bit more review about why we think shear is bad and how could tropical cyclones like overcome that. Then I'm going to proceed to tell you about the factors or the ingredients that can help tropical cyclones intensify even when there is shear. And once we know what are the factors, this is almost like cooking, right? When we cook, we need the ingredients and we need the steps. So first we have the factors, then we need the steps. So the last component will be addressing the physical mechanisms, which is my ultimate goal, getting at physical processes that govern intensification. So let's start talking about what shear does to tropical cyclone, and I'll make this into simplified schematics. So to a first degree approximation, we can think of the tropical cyclone as a cylinder rotating. So if there is no shear, like on the diagram on the left, what that's going to do is that it's just going to move the tropical cyclone more or less uniformly in the direction of the flow. Now, when there is shear, the, that cylinder at the top is going to want to go in one direction, but the cylinder at the bottom is going to go want to go in another direction. And that, what that does is that it tilts the vortex of the tropical cyclone. So you can, I like to think about it like if you have a slinky and you like, like impose some shear with your hands, like if you have the slinky just standing up, right, it's upright. But if you like give it some shear with your hands, it's going to be tilted. And we think that's bad for several reasons, one of them being that so the tropical cyclone likes to generally intensify by drawing heat from the ocean, converging it, and then it ascends in the eye wall that uh, those clouds release energy, that energy is transformed into spinning up the winds. But if you have something like this, then you slow down that process because then you have eddies and then there can be other things that are going to limit the, the clouds, are going to push them to one side and not concentrate that heating where it needs to be so that it is efficient in transforming the heat from, again, drawn from the ocean and released within the clouds to kinetic energy that spins up the winds. So there have been research that have suggested that if the tropical cyclone can go from this to this, then it's very likely to intensify. But what they haven't told us about is like how does that, how does that actually happen? If you have something that it's tilted, how come it can become back all upright? And that's part of the research I'm doing um, currently, like trying to understand those processes. Another way in which vertical wind shear affects tropical cyclones is that it organizes convection. So it, it organizes the clouds. And by organize, I mean this. So this is an example. This is Tropical Storm Erica. This, in the gray shading, we have uh, the satellite what this, the, where the clouds are. This is infrared and infrared brightness temperatures. The cyclone center is here. So the low pressure center is over here. Then we had a drone that flew around the system like this, and it had a radar, so the shading is color shaded, is, is the radar. It's similar to what you see on TV from your local meteorologist. 
So this doesn't look at all like that first satellite image that I showed you. There is no eye, eye wall. Instead, all of the precipitation is displaced. So in this case, the shear is coming like this. So in the direction of the shear or down shear, we have all the heaviest precipitation. In the direction of up shear, we have relatively no precipitation. This is what we call a wave number one asymmetry because you have precipitation in one side of the storm but no precipitation in the other. And some people have suggested that this precipitation can be so strong that it can stretch like the tube and create a new center of low pressure, a new center of, lo of rotation. And that's what they call down shear vortex reformation. Or they can also say that if this precipitation goes from looking like this to looking like the first Im satellite image that I showed you where it wraps around all around the center of low pressure, then those are two ways in which the tropical cyclone, again, could overcome the effects of shear and intensify. However, the difficulty here is, again, so we know that could happen, but we don't know exactly how those processes happen. The last effect of shear, or at least that we know of, is the intrusion of cool, dry air. So if we were to take a slice through the tropical cyclone, we would have height, versus radius, where radius is essentially the distance from the eye. This is what to, again, a very simple approximation the tropical cyclone would look like. So air would come here, would rise, and then like the exhaust and maybe sink and come back. So when there is shear, however, if there is dry air also in the environment, the they, because the shear tilts the vortex and there are eddies, those eddies could take that dry air and import it into the clouds. And what that does is that it reduces the buoyancy of the clouds, it reduces, again, the efficiency of the system in converting heat to kinetic energy. And there are two ways, as they are suggested here, there is some debate as to which one is more damaging. The important thing to note here is that whether it's like directly importing dry air aloft or whether it's importing dry air through the surface, either way, these two could disrupt the tropical cyclone. And I have done some research to understand that. I particularly looked at two tropical cyclones and I found that if we were looking at the tropical cyclone in the direction of the shear, where the water vapor is where the high water vapor is really matters because it, if it is about five kilometers above the ground and like in all directions but especially to the left of the shear vector what that does is that it promotes those deep clouds that are able to again like continue or promote the intensification via that conversion of heat into kinetic energy so this is, broadly speaking, and I will criticize my own work here because, to be honest, I only looked at two cases, and I'll talk about a little bit more detail soon, but I only looked at two cases, and it was also using computer model forecast, but for two past tropical cyclones. So it wasn't really clear from this, even though it was a plausible way, it wasn't very clear like how this was generalized for tropical cyclones all over the world. So let me recap what I have said so far so that we can go to the next part. So vertical wind shear is generally bad for tropical cyclones because it tilts the vortex. It organizes convection but in a rather asymmetric way and because it imports cool dry air to the tropical cyclone. And all of these disrupt the conversion of heat to kinetic energy. And I would like to argue that our knowledge is limited because just like I said when I criticized my own previous work, we focus only on a few cases. The, mo the work that has been done that hasn't been like um, case studies have been rather simple or small sample cases. And also like I mentioned, all of what I said of how can a tropical cyclone overcome shear, it really refers to incidental evidence. So something happened, the tropical cyclone intensify. Magic. The question here really is how does that happen? So let me remind you the question we're after is how do weak tropical cyclones intensify? We already know what shear does, so let's try to see if we can identify what factors can overcome can help the tropical cyclone overcome shear and intensify. 
And so to do that, I went and did uh, what I call a global climatology, meaning that I looked at data for many, many years and for all tropical cyclones around the globe. Here are the data sets that I use, briefly speaking. The first one provides us information of tropical cyclone position and intensity all over the world. Then I use free analysis, which is just a graded data set that combines model, computer model information with observations, but it gives us an estimate of what the atmosphere, winds, temperature, humidity look like. And I also use graded data sets that provided information about the ocean temperature. So what I did was that in these data sets, I looked for the tropical cyclone, and then I averaged quantities around a 500 kilometer radius from the cyclone, where we generally define that as the environment. And we looked at different variables, but the takeaway message is that when we combine the, this data, we're able to track over 2,600 tropical cyclones all over the world between 1982 and 2014. And this map of the world shows us the position of those tropical cyclones separated by six hours. So that's a lot of data points. I should mention that I eliminated points that were inland, so this is only looking at, at tropical cyclones over the ocean. And because tropical cyclones can undergo, can, they, they can live for a very long time, right? So because they can go from one place to another, they can experience different conditions, I treated each data point along each tropical cyclone as an in independent data point. And that's what I called events. So that gives me a sample size of over 47,000 individual events where I can look at, okay, so was there an intensification now or now, and what were the factors that contributed to intensification? Let me walk you through the steps to do that comparison. So we focus only on 24-hour intensity changes. So I know the information today at 4.30 p.m. I want to know the information tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. So this is 24-hour intensity changes. The moderate shear definition is given here. And then I have two groups. So the first group is tropical cyclones that experience shear and are able to intensify. And the second group is tropical cyclones that experience shear but did not intensify. They remain at the same intensity. I did not compare against weakening, which would be the opposite of intensifying, because most of the weakening were already about to make landfall or about to like, go over cold water, so I wanted to make this sample as homogeneous as possible. And speaking about keeping this comparison as homogeneous as possible, I am employing an analog approach, where by analog I mean that because I have more intensifying that steady state, for each intensifying event, I look for a steady state event that was under similar shear magnitude. So it's like looking for twins, because if I didn't do that, then shear was part of the answer. So stronger shear, no intensification, that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for, we have the same shear, you intensify or not, what, what, what are the differences? So let's start looking at some of the results, and this is what they are going to look like. So if we take all of those samples, we can calculate statistics. And for example, here we have distribution, so we have normalized probability in the y-axis, and the variable of interest in the x-axis. In, in this case, we're looking at temperature over the ocean in degrees Celsius. So the bars show the distribution in red for the intensifying group, in blue for the steady state group. Where you see stars, that means the difference is statistically significant at the 99% level. And the star is plotted at the mean value of each of the group. So in this case, we see more red towards higher values, and the star is towards higher values. That means that intensifying events over undershear are, are moving over warmer oceans. This is what it essentially tells us about. Intensifying events move also over environments where there is plenty of moisture. And we can measure that by looking at the precipitable water vapor, which is an in inter integral of how much water vapor there is in the atmosphere. And again, we see the red towards higher values, that means higher precipitable water vapor 
than in the case of steady state. But like I said, precipitable water is a vertical integral. In my previous research, we found, okay, the water vapor may be above, like, five kilometers above the ground. It's, it's more distinguishing. And that was indeed the case in this climatology. So now I can generalize the results that I showed you from the two case studies. Where if we look at the relative humidity at mid-levels, where mid-levels are roughly speaking four to six kilometers above the ground, and we average it, again we see red towards higher, that means that there is more mid-level humidity. There is more water vapor, specifically about, about four to five, four to six kilometers above the ground. That doesn't mean that near the ground there is not, it just means that whether it intensifies or not, it, it doesn't depend so much on it because there may be so much because these are just over ocean, over warm oceans anyway. It's just that the, in the mid, in the mid levels where it's harder to get the water vapor, then that becomes more of a predictor. So based on previous work, we have learned that yes, uh, case studies show that warmer oceans and more moist atmosphere are conducive for intensification, here we're able to quantify it. But, like I said, these this distributions of water vapor may not be uniform around the tropical cyclone, and for that we couldn't use this statistics approach. It's, instead, we wanted to see at what we would see on a weather map. And so what I did was that I went into that created data set, I looked for each tropical cyclone, and I saved the fields st centered on the tropical cyclone, and then I performed a coordinate transformation so that I could put all of the cyclones in the direction of the shear. And what we get is a framework where in the ordinate, the distance is direct distance from the storm center along the shear vector, so down shear or up shear, just like downstream or upstream, but with respect to the shear. And then the distance in the abscissa is uh, distance to the, either to the right or the left of the shear vector. And what I can do is that then I can take all of the intensifying events, all of the steady state events, take the difference between the two, and the, this is what the difference looks like. I will draw your attention only to the colors. The, which showed the difference between the mean of intensifying events and the mean of steady state events. Whatever you see those dots, that means that the difference is statistically significant at that particular point. And just for reference, I'm showing what the field would look like in the black contours. In this case, we're looking at the mid-level humidity, about, about five kilometers above the ground, and we see red everywhere, meaning that everywhere is more humid. But, importantly, the largest differences are in this region, which is up shear. And that means, that tells us that it's not only more humidity, but also more uniformly distributed around the tropical cyclone. Because if we look at the black contours, the maximum is here. So the fact that the largest difference is here, that means that it's not only that there is more where there is already a maximum, it's the, max the difference is largest where there is generally a low value. So more, but also more uniform, and that's also reflected in the sea surface, in the underlying ocean. So we take a look at the surface latent heat flux, which is essentially that energy that drives the tropical cyclone, and again, warm colors everywhere, meaning stronger heat flux, so more energy for the tropical cyclone to intensify, and once again, those largest differences are in this half of the tropical cyclone. So these, these results together, the, the surface latent heat fluxes with the humidity suggest to us that there were just more favorable conditions for heavier precipitation. Now I cannot assess that with that data set because it's a data set based on model. Instead, I use satellite estimates of precipitation rates, and I confirm that indeed the tropical cyclones that are able to intensify not only have more humidity and stronger surface latent heat fluxes, they also have heavier precipitation, as indicated by these warm colors here. So what we learn is that, yes, tropical cyclones have more moisture, but we hypothesize from this result that 
It's not only the amount of moisture, the amount of energy that's being imported from the ocean, it also matters how it's horizontally distributed around the tropical cyclone. In the interest of time, I'll um, skip this slide, but I'll summarize from this climatology that we found out that yes, there are factors that we can detect and can tell us something about the chances of intensification. So we can now go and tell the forecasters, okay, so if there is shear, but if these things are happening, like the water vapor is like uniformly distributed or the surface liquid heat fluxes are high, the ocean surface is warm, then now the forecasters will know, okay, even though there is shear, maybe the tropical cyclone will intensify and they can be more cautious about their decisions. This is just a schematic diagram, just summarizing what we found, but there are still open questions. In particular, we still haven't dug into what are the physical processes. And most importantly, we found that there, there is that result about the water vapor in the mid, in the mid levels, but we don't know what the sense, since we don't know what the processes are, we don't know what the sensitivity of those processes are. And that leads me to the last part of this talk in which I will be diagnosing physical mechanisms. Rather than using this data set that I told you about, I'm gonna be using computer models, and here's why. The data set that I showed you, it's only available at about 70 kilometers, roughly, so that's, if you think of a tropical cyclone, which it may be like 100 kilometers across, that's only one data point at most, so what we were seeing before, it's generally speaking, the environment around the tropical cyclone. I want to know what's happening in the tropical cyclone. That other data set is also available only every six hours, which for some standards may be high temporal resolution, but for me it's not high enough. I want data every six minutes. <laughs> I know the scales with paleoclimate are different, so. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I turn instead to a computer model in which my goal is to diagnose physical processes using a simplified framework. And by simplified, I mean that I am not taking the real atmosphere, I am removing certain components of the atmosphere. I am using the Advanced Research WARF model. The WARF stands for Weather Research and Forecasting. It's a commonly used model for studies and prediction of weather. And the cool thing about this model is that you can gradually increase your resolution by having different domains. So I have three different domains, which essentially means three different cubes following the tropical cyclone. And what I do is that I tell the model, okay, here we have this big square, the boundary conditions are doubly periodic, so what's happening here, it's here, it's here, it's communicating here and above. Uh, it, the domain is big enough that it's not affecting so much the tropical cyclone, but then I am going down to two, two kilometer grid spacing, which allows me to explicitly detect what are the clouds doing, what are the different um, precipitation modes doing. And so, yeah, I tell the model, here's an environment, it's, there is no variations in this ocean temperature, it's 27 degrees centigrade everywhere. Uh, there is some shear, so I give it some shear, and I also tell the model here is a hypothetical tropical cyclone. We integrate over time, and we see what that does. And perhaps an important point to note is that when it comes to weather studies, we more than likely want to have multiple integrations of the same model because the atmosphere is a chaotic system, meaning that a small change that you make, is, it can make a big change later on. So to account for that, um, for that chaos, essentially, for that variability, we introduce teeny tiny perturbations to the water vapor in the lowest kilometer, and that gives us 20 different realizations, and then we can use those to study tropical cyclones. So, I'm going to proceed to show you an animation now so, in, so that you can see what this model does. On the top, I'm going to have a time series. So in the y-axis is the maximum wind speed. That's going to be measuring the intensity of the tropical cyclone. And it is as a function of time. So this is a hypothetical time beginning at zero hours and going all the way to 144 hours. So that's six days. 
We have two members. One of them is going to predict intensification earlier than the other. So I call that the early member, which is going to be shown in green. I call the other the late member, which is shown in purple. So that's already a lot to digest, but <laughs> the panels are going to show us clouds. So whenever you see white, that means there is deeper clouds. Whenever you see dark, like right now, it's that there is no clouds. And they are following the Tropical Cyclone Center. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. And you can choose where to look at. This is going to play several times. But what you're going to see is that initially, we gave a tropical cyclone without clouds. It generates clouds, but that doesn't look like a tropical cyclone yet, right? So it turns out that what's happening is that there is a lot of cloudiness, but all of those clouds are moving around the low pressure center. And it turns out that at some point, the tropical cyclone is able to have clouds all around the center of low pressure. And it turns out that that is a good predictor of when the tropical cyclone will begin to intensify. So I'm going to let that play. So far, they are very similar, but soon one is going to start moving faster than the other. And I'll pause it here, actually a little bit longer. OK, right there. So at this point, 96, uh, over 96 hours into the simulation, one of the members from my set of simulations now has clouds all around, and we can see the eye. So that is what I call the symmetrization of precipitation. But in the other case, we only have all the clouds towards one side of the cyclone. And it turns out that that is a good indicator so again, information that we can give to the forecasters. If we see this process happening, then the tropical cycling is very likely to intensify. I'm going to like skip to the next slide, where now we have all of the ensemble, because remember, I have 20 different members. And on the top, I have, again, the maximum wind speed. Now it's in meters per second. This is a function of time. We have the early member in green, the purple member in the late member in purple, and all of the other members in other colors. The dots show us when that intensification begins, and we see the variation. On the bottom, we have a measurement of how, of the distribution of the precipitation. So this is only just to generalize how that is, how the precipitation is changing over time. And so in the y-axis is what I call symmetricity, so how symmetric the precipitation is. All you need to know is that the higher the number, the more symmetric, so the more likely that you have that I. And the lower, the more likely that precipitation is just pushed to one side. And the bottom line of here is that all of the members show a rapid increase. So all of the members are becoming more symmetric just before beginning the intensification. So OK, that's fine. But again, we want to get physical processes. And I will summarize some results from these physical processes um, uh, part. So I know it's late in the day, so probably you don't want to see equations. <laughs> so I'll walk you through what this means. But I, I like to put the equation for those that are mathematically inclined, like me. <laughs> so what we have here is an equation that essentially measures the spin. So it, it is an equation for the area average vorticity or the circulation. So imagine we have our tropical cyclone. We can have a box centered on the tropical cyclone. And we can integrate the variables along that box to get, so how uh, is the tropical cyclone's strength changing because of these different processes? And the four different processes are this. So the first one, which I may call the stretching, is just like drawing like the spin. And it, you can imagine if you have a cylinder, if you squish it and make it taller, that's stretching. So that, that is what that term is. The other is the eddies. So that may be like small scale eddies that are entering or exiting this box. The other one is tilting, which if you're familiar with tornadoes, th this becomes important because you may have vortex vortices rotating like this, but then if you have like all of a sudden a cloud, then that 
vorticity that's rotating like this, all of a sudden it can rotate like that. So that's tilting. And the last one is friction, which just tends to cancel all of these contributions. And friction is usually spinning down or weakening the system. So when I calculate this budget, this is what those that looks like. So first we're going to be looking at this term on the left, which is the area average vorticity tendency. And we have so pressure, which is a measure, again, of height above the ground as a function of time. And this is just for one member, that early member. And when it begins intensifying, it's marked here by this, that, by this solid line. And we see positive tendencies, meaning it is like spinning up, so they rotate, it, it's rotating faster. But interestingly, we, we start seeing that, si that signature even before, and I placed another line because that line represents when the, that convection, that, that precipitation reached a specific side of the storm. So it turns out that after it makes, after the precipitation makes it to that side of the storm, vorticity starts increasing, so the vortex is already spinning faster. So we thought this could be happening for several reasons. The first one being that, remember I told you shear tilts the vortex, so we thought, oh, it's tilting back. And if that is the case, we expected to see positive contribution from eddy. But when we look at the eddy, it's actually negative here. So it's not just realigning. When we look at the other terms, it turns out that it's because of stretching. So if we focus between the dash and solid line, we see a lot of positive, meaning that there is just these tubes of, that are rotating that are being stretched. And that is something that's happening locally. So there is also contributions from tilting, but this one is the most important, and it is telling us that instead of like being tilted and just realigning, there is a new center of low pressure forming by the action of convergence of that, those vorticity features that are embedded within the precipitation. So if I were to put this into a hypothesis and use a real example, so this is Hurricane Ophelia of 2011. On the left, it is, it is somewhat similar to what I showed you in the animations from my computer model. The precipitation is all to one side, but if that if the rotation that's within those clouds is able to form a new low pressure center, then it may look like this, and that's essentially what that budget that I just showed you is measuring. And we find that this restructuring, this change in the structure is necessary because then it can initiate a feedback that can lead to intensification. So the last bit that I have is that we found that the water vapor was important before, right? So we want to test this with the computer model. So we ran the simulations again, but we put a more moist atmosphere or a drier atmosphere. And we ran seven different members, so the, the black line is kind of the control. So we run seven members that have the same environmental humidity. Then we increase it and we run those same members, or we decrease it and we run those ensemble members. And again, we have maximum wind speed as a function of time. And what we find is that indeed, if there is more moisture in the environment, then intensification happens faster. And you can imagine because of the time scale of this, so if it happens faster, it's more likely to happen before the tropical cyclone either runs into cold waters or into land. So we're able to confirm this. I won't show you the details of the budget again, but we also see that the drier the environment, the less likely that restructuring process is. So more moisture is good because it accelerates that change in structure that is necessary for intensification. So let me summarize what I talked about today. So we're interested in the problem of how do weak tropical cyclones intensify, even when their conditions may not tell us that the tropical cyclone is likely to intensify. Through a climatological analysis and computer models, we found that the thermodynamics, that is the underlying ocean and the environmental water vapor, can tell us something about the chances of intensification even when there may be shear. We found that through the computer simulations in comparison to observations, weak shear tropical cyclones are able to change their structure, and when they are able to change that structure, 
then they are able to intensify by a combination of convergence of vorticity or spin near the surface. And also, I, had, I didn't show you here, but because the air starts ascending at a lower altitude, so it makes the vertical mass flux more bottom heavy. And we also think that based on those idealized simulations, making the atmosphere drier or more moist, that likelihood of restructuring depends on, that, on those conditions that we found are important. So if I were to just bring this back and just finish here, this is what I showed you at the beginning, the general life cycle of a tropical cyclone, but if now we add shear, then we need to add an extra step. If the tropical cyclone is able to go through that step, then it may intensify. If not, then it won't intensify under shear. So that's all I have. Thanks for your attention, and I'll take any questions.